All right, so I would like to, stay, to start with a story about security and privacy and design and humans. And specifically, this is a story about somebody who's going through a really big life change and using technology to help herself through this. So when I started grad school in Seattle about seven years ago, I started volunteering at a local NGO that helps refugees and recent immigrants. And one thing that I often did was I would go to their job class in my volunteer slot, and I would help people with whatever computer tasks they needed to do. So it could be making a resume, um, managing online accounts. And the online factor was important because most job applications are online at this point. So one day pretty early on, I was sitting in the computer lab at the NGO with a woman who I'm gonna call Amina, and she was from Somalia. And she said she wanted my help creating an email account. Um, and I wasn't totally clear on why she wanted my help, but I thought, you know, sure, this is what I'm here for. I'll help with whatever she wants. And it became clear pretty early on uh, why she needed my help, and it's because she wasn't comfortable using a keyboard and mouse. And I have since learned that it's very common that people who come to the US as refugees from Somalia have spent years or even decades in refugee camps and they don't have access to computers. Uh, they often have phones, but no computers. So they come to the US and they may have never used a keyboard and a mouse. And the mechanics of learning to type are really difficult. So at her direction, I typed in her first name and her last name. We made her a user account, I mean a, a username. And then we got to the password part. And I felt uncomfortable about typing in a password for her. Um, but she insisted that she wanted me to do it because typing was difficult. Um, she had a hard time creating capital letters, which I think Google may have required at the time. So I said, okay, let's make you a password. And she said, no, it's okay, I already have one. Um, and then she gave me a four digit number. And I thought, wait, what is your password? Where did that number come from? And I think more importantly, where else is it being used? Because the way she told it to me, it was like, this was the password that she would use everywhere. It was accepted. So we went back and forth a few times, and we were both really confused. And it turned out this was her ATM pin. Um, and once I figured this out, I explained that this was way too short to be used as an email password, and I made her, we made her a new password, um, and I wrote it down at her request, and she put it in her purse. She got her email account, and then over the successive weeks of job class, uh, I and other people helped her apply to jobs. But I think as a security and privacy researcher, there's also a lot going on here. And I think there is an argument that her password creation strategy puts her at risk for things like identity theft and account compromise. But I think the more important question is why is this happening and how did this situation arise? I think there's three important things. The first is that refugees like her are in a vulnerable position, um, socially and financially. They're also heavily incentivized to apply for jobs online. And when I say heavily incentivized, I mean that there's very little support for refugees in the US. So the, amongst the clients that I worked with, um, a lot of them were receiving the support that they were allotted from the US government, but they ended up homeless at one point or another. The support was not enough. So there's this massive incentive to get a job as quickly as possible. And job applications are online these days. And the third component is that to do these online job applications. She's using technology that isn't built for somebody with her cultural knowledge and skills. And these three things add up to put her at risk for security and privacy harms. So that's what this talk is about. It's about how somebody who experiences geopolitical change, which I'll define in a second, um, is at increased vulnerability to security and privacy harms. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, geopolitical change is something that is driven by a massive, massive political event, like a war, um, so refugees who leave their home country because of a war or destabilizing conditions, or it's something like a natural disaster where there's a lot of uh, policy shift or government intervention. And stepping back for a second, why, why can't we just study individual populations? Why do we have to think about this in, in the abstract? Um, we can and should study individual populations. But I think it's important to step back for a second and think about this abstractly uh, to find the common threads, to find the things that don't match up between populations' needs and uh, threats and risks. And I think altogether it can help us um, support other vulnerable populations and maybe find other types of vulnerability that we don't really think about. And I think ultimately can help us design for a safer and more equitable world.
So what can we learn about the answer to this question from the story about Amina? Um, I think the first thing is that refugees, when they come to the US, they face new actors, new threats, new assets, new types of information, new technologies. And when they're in this transition period, uh, they're vulnerable because how can they properly respond to threats and risks if they don't know what they are yet? I think a social security number is a great example of this. Um, so how do you decide who to give your social security number to? Uh, a lot of clients told me that they were told in their cultural orientation that they should never give their social security number to anybody. And that's a good rule until your caseworker asks for it because they're gonna help you apply for jobs. Um, it's a fine rule until you get a job and then you have to give your employer social. Um, then maybe you open a bank account and you probably need it for that. So now we have an exception to the rule. But then at some point, maybe you'll get a phone call and that phone call will say, I'm your bank, um, give me your social security number. And that sounds like a scam, right? So now we have an exception to the exception to the exception. And it, it goes on forever. And the point is that it's really complicated. Um, and I can't define rules, and I've grown up with the idea of a social security number. So it's orders of, more, orders of magnitude more complicated. When you're at the same time, you really, really need a job. Maybe you're still learning English and you're not quite fluent enough to pick up on the linguistic differences of someone who's, who's making a spam call or a spam email. Um, and you're also navigating these bureaucracies that are new to you. So the takeaway here, um, the first part of the answer to this question, which I'm gonna put in these little bubbles on the right side of the screen, is that geopolitical change creates destabilizing conditions that cause people's threat models to become incomplete and that creates vulnerability inherently. The second part of this, so I'm gonna gray out the bubbles when I'm talking, when I'm not talking about them. Um, the second part of this answer about the connection between geopolitical change and security and privacy harms is about how other needs emerge and people might prioritize or deprioritize security and privacy. So uh, other teachers and volunteers and case managers told me that other clients expressed to them that they were uneasy giving out personal information, even to them. And this is a quote from a different Somali woman who puts it, she says it's a gambling situation. And she's talking about how she doesn't want to give her information to social workers and case managers, um, but she has to because she needs help getting a job and getting housing and applying for these things. So I'm not concerned about whether her threat model is correct here, but she can't make her actions match her threat model because these other needs have gotten in the way and because she's forced to deprioritize security and privacy. So finally, the third component of this is about how all these design misalignments add up and they become systemic inequities and they exacerbate other systemic inequities. So I think there are a lot of examples um, in the identity verification and authentication process. Uh, so if you think about birthdays, um, it's, very, it's fairly common in a lot of places around the world for people not to keep track of the day they're born because it's not culturally important. So they, men, they may then come to the US and they don't know their actual birthday, but they have to pick a legal birthday because you need to have a legal birthday here. And they often pick January 1st. This was common amongst the populations that I was working with. Uh, and this kind of breaks some authentication processes. So for example, I knew a guy who was from Somalia and he had a very common first and last name and a legal birthday of January 1st. And he applied to be a rideshare driver and they did a background check using only his name and birthday. And it came back and it said, you're wanted for you know, violent assault 20 years ago or something. But he had only come to this country as a refugee in 2013, so it wasn't him. But he had no way of you know, proving it wasn't him. Um, and it breaks in this way disproportionately, and it's, un it's disproportionately unfair for people from the population where birthdays are not randomly distributed, like this assumes they are. Um, I think security questions are also another example of where authentication processes make these cultural assumptions and they start to break. So not everybody changes their name when they get married. Um, so they may not have this information. Uh, if you think about the question, what is the make and model of your first car? I didn't have a, a driver's license until I had at least four email accounts. So I'm sure I just made up that information. Uh, and the point is not that like, you can't make information. 
But the point is that when you ask somebody for information that they don't have already, that creates a barrier to security and privacy and authentication. And all of those add up with other barriers and they become systemic inequities. So let me give you a few more examples of how these three themes interplay in three other populations. Um, and there, first I'll talk about Sudanese activists and specifically activists during the revolution in 2019. And I should say that I was only able to do this work because of my amazing co-lead author, Ala, who is from Sudan. Uh, and this is kind of along the same lines of geopolitical change that refugees are experiencing. It's a destabilizing event. The other two populations are more along the lines of natural disaster. So it's something where there's a lot of policy shift and um, government intervention. So the first is people during kind of us, the whole world, uh, during the start of COVID, and when there is this talk about exposure notification apps, this question of, are you gonna use one? And the final population is people who are affected by hurricanes. So to begin with the first two themes together, um, Sudanese activists face this changing set of adversaries. They, there was first the dictator, and then they over, the, over, the dictator was overthrown in a military coup, then there was the military, um, the police were always an adversary. And they never were completely sure who their adversary was, uh, what their capabilities were, and what they were willing to do. So we heard about, uh, they developed a lot of strategies to deal with all this. Um, and one strategy that was very common was manually deleting text messages, uh, like just text and WhatsApp messages. Because one threat that we heard about was this, uh, if they go to a protest and they get arrested, the police will take their phone and look through it and they don't wanna be found out as an activist. Uh, and you might be thinking, why didn't they use Signal or Telegram or one of the apps uh, that does this automatically? And the answer is that the people who were using Telegram already did use this feature. Um, but not, not that many people were already using Telegram. And almost nobody was using Signal. And it turns out that if I download Signal, but none of my friends do, it actually doesn't matter because I still can't text them. So there's this problem of group adoption, uh, and they solved it by not trying to force everyone to use the same app, but by instead implementing this regimented approach to deleting messages. Um, so they kind of, they made do with what they had and it worked out for them. But there is this environment of uncertainty about everything and about all the threats they were facing. So they did what they could with the technology they had. Uh, and moving on to COVID, which was also a time of a change in risk to physical safety in a very different way. Um, we ran a bunch of surveys right when there was uh, the, you know, things were shutting down and there was this talk about exposure notification apps. And we wanted to know, you know, would you use this app, you know, in what circumstances? And we found that people had a lot of misconceptions about how the apps worked and a lot of concerns about data use and data misuse and specifically location tracking. And a lot of people who were concerned about location tracking were actually from places where the apps they would be using wouldn't be tracking their locations. Uh, and, but they, a lot of people directly compared, uh, to paraphrase a little bit, if, if they downloaded the app, they would, be, they would receive like health benefits or benefits to their community. But if they didn't download the app, um, they would be preserving their digital safety. And they directly contrasted these two and prioritized one or the other. And without making any sort of judgment on what the right call is, uh, because everyone's situation is their own context, um, they have to be the judge for themselves, people were making this decision off of incomplete and sometimes inaccurate information, despite the information actually being out there. It just wasn't making its way to the end users. And finally, this environment of incomplete information also happens after hurricanes. Um, so for example, there's often a lot of physical damage to a community. So the power can go out, uh, cell towers can be damaged or destroyed, um, roads and other infrastructure can be damaged, and you don't know how long it's gonna be out for. And people express to us in surveys that they were often choosing between, well, do I use my phone now? Do I use my phone and computer to check in on my friends, use social media, look at what's going on in my community, see, see if people need help? Or do I preserve the battery in case I have an emergency and I have to call 911 or something? And everyone makes this choice for themselves. Again, there's no way to know, but there's this um, environment of incomplete information because nobody knows how long the power is gonna be out. 
Uh, and it really affects the way they use technology and the things they're able to get from it and the needs they're able to fulfill. So in these three examples, um, we can see that people experience changes that affect uh, their access to technology and their ability to use it normally, the threats that to, their, to safety, and the things that they have to keep safe, the assets that could be information or it could be something physical or it could be something else. And a counterpart to this is about prioritization. Everybody here was changing how they prioritize security and privacy. So moving on to this third theme about design misalignments, um, there are just so many design misalignments, things, little designs and technologies or big designs that didn't work for certain populations and they made it more difficult for them. Um, I, my favorite example is something that Twitter did during the Sudanese revolution. So they turned on two-factor for everybody. Uh, and the problem was that Sudan had been under international sanctions for many years at that point, and Sudanese users couldn't add their phone numbers. And yet the activists still needed to use Twitter because they used it to connect to other activists through direct messages. They were organizing, they were getting out the word about protests, so it was a really important tool for them. So they developed a couple workarounds. Um, sometimes people asked friends and family who were abroad to add their own phone numbers, and then they would kind of do a little manual two-factor um, via whatever channel they wanted. Sometimes they were able to get a global SIM card, so they would appear, they would have a, an international phone number, but they would still be in Sudan. Not everyone was able to do this. And I, one thing that's interesting about this is that these could have actually increased their security and privacy if their two-factor codes weren't going through the telecom network in like the typical way. But I don't think that was Twitter's intention. Um, and that's kind of the point that Twitter made this design decision. And I think interestingly, it's kind of a, like a generally good all-purpose security thing that we like to say is turn on two-factor. Um, but it had these consequences here. It had cascading consequences for a group of people who were already vulnerable and facing a lot of change in their lives. So to wrap up, um, what, like, where do we go from here? Because change is constant. Change is not bad. Uh, it's good. It's often necessary. And I think the question is, how do we design for people who are experiencing change? And how do we design for the people who are made vulnerable by change? Um, and one reason that I think it's helpful to talk about multiple populations at once is that you can see that one design isn't going to fit everyone. It's not, one tool is not going to work for everyone. And even if there are some surface similarities, their threat models are all so different that how do you design something that fits everybody's threat model? I think it's really hard. Um, but I think it's worth examining multiple populations at once so you don't design something for one population that hurts another population. So I think that geopolitical change can sort of be a lens through which to think about some pieces of vulnerability. And I think there are these three questions to ask. Like when you think about people who you're designing for, some of them are gonna be experiencing geopolitical change in many different ways. Um, how is their threat model gonna be going to become incomplete? And how can you best support that? Uh, maybe you can give them options. Maybe you can support that uh, technically. Maybe you can detect that they've gone through a change. Maybe it's a bad idea to try to detect they've gone through a change. I think it's probably different for a lot of populations. Uh, but it's, it's something that we need to think about when we design. Another thing to think about is uh, needs other than security and privacy and how people are going to prioritize security and privacy not in a vacuum. So if people are going to prioritize it, um, do they have the tools to do that safely? Are you giving them the tools to do that safely and in a way that is usable and safe to them? And if they're deprioritizing it, is that really necessary? Can we design it in a way so that they don't have to deprioritize it? Uh, and then finally, I think thinking about systemic inequity and the way that uh, design misalignments contribute to that and the way that they're, they're distributed unfairly, um, I think we need to think about things other than technology to tackle systemic inequities. Um, and then think about you know, ways through design that we can counteract some systemic inequities. Um, there are also other reasons for vulnerability, but I that are not related to geopolitical change. But I think this is one that encompasses a lot of change that people are going through today. Um, and I hope that this can help us design something safer. Um, thank you, that's all I have. And I would love to take questions.